that you've learned the foundational aspects of the proper disc golf technique during the beginner series, it's time to take those learning tools up a notch. Hopefully you've had a chance to get out onto the course and try out some of the techniques that we've talked about. If not, these subjects coming up will be easily applicable and fit right into the beginner series seamlessly. In this teaching series, we are going to take your game to the next level by unlocking some of the secrets of how to use the X step properly, how to increase your accuracy and limit those errant throws, how to practice the right way, and several other key foundational subjects that will take your game to the next level. By the end of the series, you're going to find yourself beating your personal records on your home course and showing your friends the techniques you learned along the way. With the power grip, you want to make sure for when you squeeze the disc, your forearm muscles become engaged, or in other words, you can feel them tighten down on the disc. Something mentally that happens to a lot of people is they start to overthink their grip because there are so many different variations out there. The key thing to remember is that all grips are going to be slightly different. So when you see your friend or watch a video online saying to try something out, it's important to remember that all of our hands are going to be slightly different, so our grips are also going to function slightly different. I started playing disc golf at 13 years old, and I gripped the disc the exact same on all of my discs, and I have never changed it up. The most important piece in grip is going to be a consistent release and being comfortable in the hand. Outside of that, it takes time for your fingers and hand to learn the dexterity of the release points, and the last thing you want to do is switch it up too much. Putters and mid-ranges typically have a deeper lip than drivers. With the power grip, your fingers are typically going to be tucked into the rim and sometimes is going to be hard to release, especially on mid-ranges and putters. It's important to note that you don't want to switch up your grip too much because then you're going to have to get used to a new grip. So when you're out on a long hole, make sure to switch up to throwing putters and get used to that release. This plays one of the more important parts in getting distance, and its movement is going to be the most important part in having accurate shots. A consistent wrist motion will allow the player a consistent angle of release and much smoother throws if used properly. What we're going to be talking about is hinging your wrist. You want your wrist to move in one motion from back to forward with little deviation, which we are defining as hinging your wrist. Your wrist motion alone is accountable for 40% of your distance and 75% of your accuracy on throws. A common mistake for most players is to try to overuse their wrist. By definition, is trying to make the wrist overcompensate for poor body position or poor reachback angle, which makes the player rotate their wrist in a twisting motion to try and turn the disc over. If you're having a problem of turning over your wrist, your disc will typically fly with what I call speed wobbles and looks like a wounded duck flying through the air. A way to go through the motion is to grip your disc and hinge your wrist in towards your forearm as I'm showing you. If your thumb rotates, instead of moving on a hinge in a back and forth motion, most likely you do turn your wrist over when you release. You do need to understand that when you rotate your wrist in comparison to hinging your wrist, your wrist mixes two different angles upon release, back and forth, and up and down. When you do this, the disc will fly with speed wobbles, and with wobbles, it will not be very aerodynamic, which in return will hold back your distance and accuracy. When you have learned a consistent and accurate throw, it will be time to learn the X step. The X step is the main technique that professionals use when looking to get more distance and accuracy by engaging their lower body by taking several steps before they throw, also known as a run up. It is important to note that once you start trying this technique, it's possible at first your consistency and distance take a slight decline, but after mastering the timing aspect of the X step, 
I can ensure you that you will get nearly 30% more distance by gaining more momentum on your throws. The X step will follow the principles of the ABC method, just a little bit more advanced. The first piece of the X step is to give yourself enough room to take about three to four steps on the teeing area. Typically for most players, that's going to be less than 10 feet of space. To start your X step, you will want to get in your power stance that we discussed in the beginner series. Knees bent, lined up feet, nose over toes. But instead of at the front of the teeing area, you will be at the back of the teeing area with your feet only a few inches apart instead of shoulder width to start out. Now that you are at the back of the teeing area in your slightly changed power stance, starting off with your lead foot, you are going to take about half a step forward, staying on the line that you drew, just like we talked about in the ABC method. Your next step is going to be on your opposite foot, and it will go behind your front foot and land just behind your heel of the first step. This is the step that defines the X step. The last step is the most important piece with the weight shift. As that foot comes forward, you will be reaching back at the same time, and just as that front foot comes down, you will be pulling through across on the same line that you have drawn to the intended target. With the correct stance and body position for your shot, you're going to be able to build momentum by staying on the line that you drew before you threw your disc. We are going to continue that line all the way through our run-up to maximize our distance potential. The whole premise of the X-Step chapter is to create momentum and keep it through one straight line, which is why you keep everything situated on one line the whole way through. The more you deviate from that line, the more power you will be losing because it won't have one direct line of momentum. When deciding which direction to line up, you're going to line up at the front of the tee pad draw your line where you're aiming at, and continue that line behind you to see what line you should be running up on. You can see that I am aiming straight at the basket as my target. I am drawing a straight line down my feet. I'm going to continue that line up on the tee pad and follow that angle through my entire shot. This allows each step of my run up to be building momentum in the correct line and by using this method, we will be maximizing our potential by not having any changes in the line. The same goes for if I am releasing to the right side of the teeing area, my run up angle is going to continue to the back left of the teeing area. The opposite being if I am releasing to the left, my run up will continue to the back right of the teeing area. For the body position on those shots, you're going to want to match your body position to allow the fastest reach back and efficient follow through as physically possible. Through this chapter, we are going to use science and momentum to explain how this is the most efficient and professional technique for all shots that will also correlate with future chapters of the disc golf instruction series. So take notes. When it comes to throwing different angles with different run-ups, it's important to match the angle of release with the disc throughout the entire reach back and when you start to pull through. Less movement in your reach back and pull through equals smoother power because you are accelerating on one direct line all the way through. The next level of that is changing your angle of release and matching your body position so that you can use your wrist in a hinging motion. Now we are going to break down different types of release angles. As we go over these angles, instead of tilting your wrist to match the angle, bend or arch your back to allow your wrist to still be in a hinging motion. Holding the disc flat in your hand is simply referred to as a flat release. This is a typical release for shots that need to fly fairly straight and your body position is fairly neutral with your knees bent and your back slightly arched. When the side of the disc closest to your body is higher than the opposite side, that is called a hyzer release. You're going to lean your upper body over to find the hyzer release. This angle of release makes the disc move from right to left. When the side of the disc that is furthest from your body is tipped higher than the side closer to your body, that is called anhyzer. The anhyzer, which is opposite to the hyzer shot, is going to make the disc move from left to right. With an anhyzer, you lean your upper body slightly backwards to get this angle of release. These angles can be as drastic or minimal as needed based on the angle that you are looking to throw on. You just follow the body position needed to match the angle of release so your wrist can function properly. 
With the previous section, you will want to match your body position with the angle of release we previously just talked about to maximize accuracy with your wrist position. Going forward, you will want to refer back to the wrist section to better understand how you should be hinging your wrist. Remember, you do not want to be rotating your wrist over on these shots. It's more efficient and productive to be matching your body position with the angle which allows your wrist to function properly to gain the most amount of power and accuracy possible. This chapter combines the wrist motion, reach back, follow through, and body position lessons. Watch these sections and combine what you have learned to get perfect technique. Contrary to people's belief, the reach back uses a lot of upper body rotation in comparison to reaching with the arm. When going to reach back, you want to rotate your whole upper body, which means you will be mirroring your back shoulder with your lead shoulder. This allows you to open up your shoulder rotation and now allows you to reach much further by not even fully reaching in the first place. A common problem that people have is holding onto the disc with their other hand because it typically will get in the way of their reach back if you don't rotate your upper body. This will limit your reach back and will not effectively allow you to rotate your upper body when holding on to the disc. By using this technique also, you will get your opposite hand out of the way by opening up your shoulders. When it comes to reach back in your run up, which will be the very last step, what you want to do is tuck your opposite arm as close to your body as possible as you start to reach back and rotate your upper body backwards. Just like an ice skater when spinning around in the air, you want to be as tight to your body as possible to allow yourself the fastest pull through. With your arm away from your body, the weight of your arm will throw your balance, which will affect your accuracy. When you start to reach back with your whole upper body, you will find that your back arm will be completely out of the way and make it much easier to not hold on to the disc during reach back. Momentum is most efficient when moving from point A to point B in one straight line with no deviation in that line. The initial reach in reaching back is point A, which is setting up your body in the pull through at the fastest speed possible before release, which is point B. With the right position on your reach back, you can start to accelerate through the line you intend to throw on with as much speed as you can handle. If your reach back isn't in the right setup for your pull through, there's going to be changes in the direct line of momentum which will affect accuracy and distance. A perfect example of this is racing a car. A car gets to its top speed by going in a straight line with no turns. When you add turns, the car is forced to slow down to stay accurate and not crash. The line of momentum that you are looking to follow is from low to high meaning your release will be a few inches above where your reach back was in comparison to your body. The reason we are reaching lower and pulling slightly higher is to gain momentum and be able to accelerate and build speed moving into our release and follow through. This compares directly to our wrist instruction and is very important for you to watch that section and apply those rules and techniques into getting an efficient reach back. Reaching low and exploding through the core is proven to be the number one way to get distance and maximize potential following our rule of creating momentum and matching our wrist angle. Let's take a look at some of the common problems people have on reaching back. With a high reach back in comparison to your body and trying to pull through your core will result in a few things. A high reach back can lead you directly into throwing into the ground because when accelerating from high to low, the direction of momentum the disc is building is down, which is not ideal for a flying disc. Another problem with a high reach back and low release is what's called dipping your shoulder. When you dip your shoulder, it affects the angle of release in your wrist position to go along with it. Dipping your shoulder when pulling through creates the disc to be released nose up which will drastically reduce the speed of the disc by taking off straight up into the air and slowing down very fast. The other option when you have a high reach back is to pull through your chest area. This is something that is not ideal and goes directly against our body position chapter because you are forced to stand straight up and down in comparison to being bent over with your hips out. 
pulling across your chest does not engage and activate any of the muscles through your back and the back side of your arm. Now you might be asking yourself, if I'm reaching from low and releasing high, how does it not go straight up upon release? That leads us to our next section on following through. The stance, body position, reach back, pull through, and wrist position all come together seamlessly into following through the correct way to create the most efficient disc golf form. The secret of distance with minimal effort is staying on one direct line of momentum when it comes to your X step, body position, reach back, pull through, and wrist position. None of which are more important than the others, because they all need to work together to maximize your potential. It starts with the body position needed to execute the proper run up up on the tee pad. With the proper body position, your body will be set up to maximize the potential of your reach back when executing the X step. With the correct reach back position, your wrist will be set up to maximize the potential of pulling through to generate the most speed you can handle before release. As you can tell, they are all tied together and when it comes to release, they all need to follow through properly by continuing on this line of momentum. The defining piece of following through properly will be your wrist position. As stated in the beginner series, the wrist has to function in a hinging motion to apply speed and spin onto the disc going into the release. There's only one way to make this hinging motion, which means everything else needs to match the wrist so it can function properly. If you are looking for an Anheuser release, the body position is leaned back slightly, which tilts the disc to the correct angle by using your body position to create a hinging wrist position. By changing your body position to match your wrist, you change your run-up angle to maximize the potential of your throw staying on one line of momentum. The reach back and pull through is going to be down the line that you are intended to release on, so by changing your run-up to match your body position, the reach back line is not going to change which creates consistency in every throw. With the Anheuser release, your body position is going to be leaned back so your wrist can function properly, which affects your follow through by forcing it to follow the angle of release, which makes the wrist move in almost a downward motion. It's very important to match your follow through with your release angle to maximize potential of your throw. So if you're looking for a left to right shot, the wrist has to follow through to the right to allow the disc to properly follow this angle of release. The opposite angles will apply when looking for a hyzer release, which flies from right to left. Since we are looking for a right to left shot, typically we will be lined up to the right side of the tee pad. This creates a left to right move on our run up across the teeing area to match the intended angle of release. Since we are looking for a hyzer release, the body position will be slightly leaned over to allow the wrist to function in a hinging motion. The follow through of the wrist is going to move in almost an upward angle and the arm will also continue on the same angle. This concludes the follow through which is the final piece of the ABC method. Although when throwing a disc, you pull through your upper body, the lower body is where you are going to generate more power to gain distance. Being able to load your hips and use your lower body weight shift is a technique used in all professional sports and is backed by science when it comes to increasing your distance in disc golf. Just like in our reach back and pull through, we want to solely focus moving on one direct line to maximize our potential of distance and accuracy. The same rules of staying in one line when shifting our lower body weight to gain distance. If you went through the beginner series, you learned that standing still to throw is the most effective way to learn the correct form while still being new to the game. Moving into the advanced series, you might have tested the X step, which is great if you have, but it's best to work on your weight shift and loading your hips while standing still or taking one step while throwing. I am going to show you and explain how to build energy by loading your back leg before you throw. Your back leg is the biggest factor when shifting your weight. 
when reaching back, your back leg should be bent slightly and it should also be carrying 70 to 80% of your body weight. This motion is going to be called loading, which is getting most of your weight in one explosive position before you start to throw. The front leg is going to be your balance tool while most of your weight is on the back side of your body. To properly load the back leg, you have to keep your upper body over the knee for just a short period before you pull through. The big problem that people have getting to this position is putting weight on their front foot before pulling through. The upper body will either make or break your weight shift depending on your body position because of that. The feet position is the next important piece of loading your weight. At a minimum, your feet have to be positioned at a 45 degree angle towards the back side of your body, if not more. The reason is the feet determine what position your hips are going to be angled and we want everything to be loaded so we can create as much energy as possible when we explode and throw the disc. As you can see when I turn my feet back, it's much easier to be loaded on that back leg. When you open your feet forward, you are actually working against your body while you are trying to reach back and that's something you want to avoid. When you have 70 to 80% of your body weight on the back side of your body lined up with your knee, at the same time, you want to start your pull through while exploding into your right leg. The explosion part of your weight shift has to move from back to front, no rotation during the shifting. Once you have shifted your weight, which does not take very long during the throw, you will be rotating your hips to open towards the target and continue into the follow through. The weight shift is one of the faster aspects of the throw based on time, but potentially the most important. It's important to really practice on loading your weight before you start to pull through. From 2009 to 2010, I went from an up-and-coming professional to the youngest winner ever of the United States Championship. The huge learning curve that I got over was how to land near the basket on approaches and short tee shots to take pressure off of my putting game, which would constantly improve my scores each and every round. I learned that if I can master my upshot routine to make it as similar as I can to my driving form, shaping shots around trees and through gaps became so consistent through my whole game by simply changing my body position slightly and learning the release off of my fingertips to hit all the different angles and speeds necessary. The main part of what I learned is I needed to relate up shots as much as I could to my driving form from the tee pad. From that point forward, I knew I was going to master standing still and throwing drives, which then directly related to throwing accurate up shots. Once you get confident in your fan grip, as we talked about in the beginner series, it becomes all about hand-eye coordination with the release coming off of your fingertips primarily. The more throws you have with the fan grip, the more you get used to spinning the disc with a specific angle of release and the more confident you will be. The best way to practice your upshots is playing catch with a friend. When playing catch, change your release angle several times and learn how to land the disc near the person where they are standing. Outside of playing catch with someone, I suggest when you play a round of disc golf, throw at least two to three upshots per hole and try to throw two to three different angles to get to the basket. In my experience, there was a small learning curve before the fan grip felt extremely comfortable throwing shots. It's important thing to remember the fan grip is designed to easily control at short distances with different angle of releases. So when you are throwing much shorter than a power grip, just keep working with it and remember it's good for short shots not to be thrown hard. When I first started throwing fan grips, the disc would constantly slide out of my hand and it never felt like a consistent shot when I stepped up to a throw. I continued through the learning curve and improved my grip pressure on the middle of the disc. With the continued growth in my grip pressure, I've learned that the tighter I could grip the disc, the more consistent my approach shots ended up being because I had more control of the angle of release. Putting in disc golf is best made into a simple stroke that you can recreate each and every time. It's best to develop a short routine so mentally you follow all of the key points before releasing the putt. Lining up, aiming, 
following through are the three most important parts of putting. I've lived off the phrase, aim small, miss small, throughout my disc golf career. When I line up for a putt, I look to find the center of the basket and aim my eyes just to the right side of the pole and aim at one chain link. Whether I am spin putting or push putting, I am always reaching out towards that chain link every time. Just like in upshots and driving off the tee pad, lining up your shoulders is going to be the most efficient way to line up your putt. In the beginner series, we talked about how you want to angle your front foot position slightly off of the pole and your back foot nearly in line with your front foot, but at a more drastic angle, which allows you to push off your foot when you rock forward. When you line up the putt, you want to stretch the putter in your hands out towards the basket and be able to look down your arm the entire way to the basket. When you begin your stroke, you want to get back to that location every single time on each putt. By lining up with your dominant shoulder, you can create a consistent release by lining up with how you're looking down your arm. Jump putting is a great way to add some power behind your putt whenever you are farther away from the basket. The rules of jump putting are you have to have the disc out of your hand and released before your feet come completely off the ground or behind your lie. I personally like to use a straddle jump putt because I can keep my left foot behind the disc and lead with my right foot towards the basket. With keeping my left foot behind the disc and leading with my right foot, it's really easy for me to line up towards the basket and when I release the putt, my right foot and my right shoulder are lined up to the right side of the basket and I can keep my hand out and follow through very similar to my regular stance when I'm closer to the basket. To make sure that you do not have a foot fault, you have to make sure that your foot stays behind your lie before you release the disc and follow through or jump towards the basket. With jump putting, you're going to want to have a high release. So bringing the disc down and following through higher than the basket is ideal whenever putting from a farther distance. With a combination of a high release and the momentum of jumping or pushing off towards the basket, making longer putts becomes much easier. To line up for a jump putt, put your non-dominant foot behind your lie. Line up your dominant foot to the right side of the disc. Your feet can almost be shoulder length apart. Try to keep the disc on one straight line, bring it between your knees, and then bring it up and follow through high above the basket. When you do this, you're going to lead with your right foot, and you're going to lead to the direction or the angle that you're looking to release. Since we're looking to have a right to left slight hyzer putt, we are going to be leading the direction of our right foot to the right side of the basket and then following through with our hand up high. While we do this, we are going to keep our left foot behind our lie and making sure that it stays on the ground before we release the putt. Even if you only use this shot for getting out of trouble or using it for really short shots, learning how to throw forehand is essential to have a complete all-around game. Throwing a forehand will allow you to work a disc with the opposite fade in comparison to your backhand drive, which opens a ton of different release angles and can save you strokes all around the course. Throwing forehand only requires a minimum flick of the wrist and can be maximized with a run-up along with weight shift. There are some similarities in forehand and backhand when it comes to reach back, wrist, and release. But first we are going to talk about grip. There are a few ways to grip a forehand, with the most popular being the stacked grip. The stacked grip uses the two strongest fingers in the hand, the middle finger and the index finger. The other grips include the one finger, the offset grip, the traditional old school grip. Similar in the backhand grip, it all depends on how it fits into your hand the strongest and most comfortable in terms of finger position. Just like in backhand, the thumb is going to be the stabilizer of the forehand grip. You want to make sure that you can tuck the disc 
into the fat of your thumb and have a nice firm grip. At the same time, you have to make sure that your fingers are pressed on the inside of the disc and not the flight plate. A common problem that people have with forehand is they grip the flight plate of the disc instead of the rim. When you grip the rim with the pad of your finger, you can use your wrist in the correct way and put spin on the disc correctly. Just like in backhand, you want to be hinging your wrist and not rotating it over. With the correct grip, you can avoid trying to rotate your hand over, which makes the disc turn over immediately out of your hand. Just like in the backhand drive, we are going to be drawing a line down our feet towards our intended target. The difference is that our leading foot is going to be angled at about 70 degrees from the intended line. The reason for the open foot position is because the weight shift happens from our back leg coming through, but there's not as much power happening, so the hips need to be squared up with the target upon release. The back foot needs to be at a 90 degree angle and is in position to be balanced and stabilized while you pull through the disc. Just like in backhand, we will be drawing a line and matching our shoulders and feet position at the same time. We are going to bring that same line into our reach back and pull through. Doing this will limit any deviation and maximize the potential of our throwing power by not having any variables involved in our reach back or pull through. Drawing a line and going from the fastest point from reach back to release is very important when it comes to maximizing distance potential on our forehand. I'm Will Shustrick. Thanks for watching Disc Golf Instruction Advanced Series.